Private equity firms have stepped up their interest in sports since the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. However, rugby, as you may have noticed, has been dealing with these firms for a number of years now, specifically dealing with two major players in CVC Capital Partners and Silver Lake. In this video, we will uncover why these two firms are so desperate to get involved with the rugby, what they see as the opportunities going forward, and why owners and unions have been so happy to welcome them in. Firstly, who are they? CVC Capital Partners are one of the world's leading private investors with over 20 years experience working in sports, previously investing in MotoGP and Formula One, but now concentrating heavily on rugby with growing stakes in the URC, Premiership, the Autumn Nations Cup and the Six Nations. They're also currently in discussions to acquire 20% of SA Rugby and are meeting with Rugby Australia later this month. It's successful with both negotiations that have a stake in eight of the world's top 10 rugby nations. Silver Lake, which has more than $88 billion in assets, is one of the largest tech investors in the world and currently has investments in the likes of Man City, the UFC and NBA's New York Knicks. They've recently paid New Zealand Rugby $200 million New Zealand dollars to secure roughly 7% of New Zealand Rugby's commercial revenue, a revenue amount that they're expecting to increase. This deal marks a massive moment in rugby that may fast-track the commercial development of the game on a global scale. But why are they buying up rugby? Both CVC and Silver Lake see a huge amount of potential for growth in rugby. The sport has reported 400 million plus fans around the world, but in their eyes, the sport hasn't been properly commercialised in the ways of football or basketball. In their view, rugby has been woefully underpromoted and is still wrongly perceived by too many as a middle-class game aimed at middle-aged white men who enjoy a pie and a pint. They also want to improve the commercial revenue of the teams and leagues they own, and they see great opportunity for significant growth in the sport from the women's game and new Tier 2 markets like the USA, as well as from Rugby 7's inclusion in the Olympics. To make sure that you don't need any external investors, Manscaped is a special deal just for you. This video is brought to you by Manscaped, the very best in men's below-the-belt grooming. They're offering all viewers of this video 20% off their entire product range and free worldwide shipping. All you have to do is use the code RUGBYPOD. That includes the incredible Lawnmower 4.0 package. So go and use the code RUGBYPOD at checkout at manscaped.com. Trust us, your balls will thank you, and we can make more videos like this. But why are rugby unions and administrators selling? Well, it all comes down to one thing, and that's money. In New Zealand's case, their finances have been buffeted by the COVID-19 pandemic, and they feel they need a cash injection to keep pace with the Northern Hemisphere rugby powers and to reinvigorate the grassroots of the game. In the case of CVC's partners, the unions and clubs were equally desperate for the cash and offer, but also understood that the global and domestic commercial rugby market has become stagnant, and hence they're open to a professional partner with a strong record and growth to help expand their revenue. But by the ludicrous amounts of money they're offering, what have they actually achieved? Well, CVC is arguably the greatest success so far in the sporting world, their most famous case study being when they sold Formula One for $4.5 billion in 2017, having made a $2.4 billion profit in a little over a decade. They achieved this growth in a number of ways, such as increasing the amount of races each year and opening up the sports to be held in lucrative countries such as Azerbaijan and Abu Dhabi, whose governments wanted to buy an F1 race as a status symbol. Most importantly, however, was their ruthlessness with media rights, whereby they always sold at the highest possible price, regardless of the consequence for the sport's popularity. Although this was a financially successful decision, CVC were accused of sacrificing the long-term health of F1 in order to make short-term profit. As in many countries, F1 has disappeared from free-to-air channels, reportedly losing 137 million eyeballs since 2010. Perhaps more firmly, the former deputy team principal of Force India Formula 1 team put it best when he accused CVC of pillaging the sport. So how do both funds plan to increase the revenue in rugby? Well, Silver Lake knows that they've invested in a huge global brand in the All Blacks, but they're a brand that are currently not monetizing themselves in a way that other big sporting brands are. According to Silver Lake, there are millions of people around the world who are potential All Black fans who are currently not paying any money towards the brand. So their whole business plan is built on finding these people, engaging with them and monetizing them. They're also planning on playing more international test matches each year, especially outside New Zealand, majority of it across the US and Asia, to try and get a stronghold on these growing markets. Additionally, Silver Lake wants to sell off the power of the All Blacks brand through coaching clinics, Drive to Survive style documentaries, more player promotion and partnerships, and of course, increased merchandise sales. CVC, who've now invested over £700 million into European rugby alone, have a wider control of the market, and so are looking at things in a different way. 
They essentially want to modernise the schedule, tournaments and competitions in order to make rugby more attractive to a wider global audience. They know that if rugby wants to join the elite sporting powerhouses, then worldwide annual competitions must take place without the overlap of club and international clashes. Without these, broadcast deals and revenue can never grow. With an equal share in the Six Nations, CBC would also be looking to convince its partners to move the Six Nations away from free-to-air TV in order to increase revenue. They've already done this with their Autumn Nations partnership with Amazon. If done successfully, this should provide a huge increase in earnings. CBC also believes that it can increase revenues through better marketing, branding and use of data. An example of this is Rot Nation's involvement in the URC. The entertainment agency founded by Jay-Z was specifically hired with the aim of broadening the league's appeal. There have also been rumours of South Africa joining the Six Nations to make it a more attractive and profitable tournament, and CBC haven't hidden their ambition to create a club World Cup, an ambition that could result in a whole new world of fiscal and broadcast opportunities. Finally, and somewhat closer to home, there's CBC's investment in both the URC and the Premiership, which should suggest that one day the two leagues will become more closely aligned. But forgetting the potential long-term health implications on rugby as a sport, what hurdles will both CBC and Silver Lake have to overcome? Well, in Silver Lake's case, the All Blacks aren't as an attractive proposition as they were last year. Although they ended up champions of the Rugby Championship, they've lost five of the last ten matches and are no longer seen as untouchable, which will surely affect the attractiveness of the brand. Additionally, New Zealand has a tiny population, which hugely hinders New Zealand rugby when it comes to negotiating power over broadcast rights and its player base. On the issue of TV rights, both firms will be worried with the market showing every sign of being in stagnant decline, having peaked several years ago. Another issue is how to fit in more matches when there are already too many games in the calendar. Simply shoehorning more tests into the schedule is not an option in order to grow revenue. But most importantly, rugby is struggling at the community and junior level, with declining numbers due to historic lack of funding, and more pressingly, the impact of the now obvious health problems which are the result of such an explosive contact sport. People aren't just switching off their screens, but they aren't falling in love with the game like they used to. With this in mind, neither rugby nor its traditional worldwide figureheads look an attractive investment proposition right now. Anyhow, it's expected that CBC and Silver Lake will remain in the sport for 10 years before looking for potential buyers. A healthy return on investment, preferably sooner rather than later. It's all that counts. The rest is frippery. That's what they do. Buy it, ship shape it, and sell the pieces off. But whether they've bitten off more than they can chew this time is yet to be seen.